Lord Jesus, I pray that you would richly bless Tom with your words that you want to give to us as a church today. And I pray that you would open our ears to hear and to really take on board what you have. May it, um, may it bear much fruit. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. The main question I want to ask you this morning, looking at this passage from John 20, is how is your heart doing this morning? Um, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I went to the doctor, and he, said, he did various tests, said I needed to lose a few pounds, and said, oh, we need to look at how your heart's doing. Uh, and in a spiritual way this morning, <clears throat> I want to ask you how your heart's doing towards Jesus. Are, are you excited about Jesus this morning? Are you passionate about Jesus today? Next week, Barry will look at the story of Peter, and Jesus comes and he asks him a question. And I want to encourage you, Jesus came into this building this morning and looked to you face to face and said, do you love me? What would your honest answer be today? And I want to look at this, this guy, Tom, Thomas in the Bible, uh, my namesake, uh, and, and see this amazing transformation that takes place, this heart change that takes place in his life. And he's a man who starts off as a doubter, but after this encounter with Jesus, we know from other sources that he's a man who went to India and planted thousands of churches, some of which are still in existence today. And if you're a Christian, I want to say that this same heart change that took place in Thomas's life also took place in, in your life. And whether you were six or 60 when you became a Christian, this heart change occurred. Ezekiel says what happened was you had a heart of stone, a heart of difficulty and hardness and criticism <coughs> and critical spirit. That was what defined your heart. It was dead to the things of God. But then the Holy Spirit did a, a heart surgery and replaced the heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And we see that happen with Thomas this morning in this passage. We see a heart transformation. And we see four things that happen to him that will have happened to you if you're a Christian. We see four things. First, he hears the apostolic message. Second, he experiences the mercy of Jesus towards him. Third, he sees the, the wounds of Jesus. And fourth, he drops his conditions. Those are the four things we're going to look at. And first, we're going to look at, he hears the apostolic message. This is the first step in Thomas's heart change. It says here in our passage, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. That's the first thing we see here in this story, is that the other disciples are telling Thomas that they've seen the Lord. And that word there, they said, it says, they told Thomas. That word is, is in Greek, it's a present continuous tense. It means they kept on telling him. And you can picture that, maybe at dinner time, or at breakfast, or when they sat around the table, or whatever. They're constantly saying, Thomas, it's really true. We've really seen the Lord. He's really, really alive. And if you're a Christian this morning, that's because you yourself have heard the apostolic message. Because the way that Jesus set it up is he did the work on the cross, he died and rose again and ascended to heaven, and he left a mission with a bunch of men and women to spread his message throughout the world. And if you're a Christian today, it's because you've heard that message and God did a work in your heart. That's how God set it up. That's why Paul says faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And in Romans 10, Paul talks through how you became a Christian. He says that no one can believe, no one can be saved unless they believe. And no one can believe unless they heard the message. And no one can hear the message unless someone preaches the message to them. You can't be a Christian this morning unless you've heard this apostolic witness that Jesus is alive. And that's the first thing that Thomas hears. He hears this witness, he hears this message that Jesus is alive. And if you're a Christian this morning, that's because you've heard that same message. That same message 
that transformed lives 2,000 years ago transforms lives today. And I, I believe if you grasp that message, if you, if you really fully believe in that message, a radical life change is going to occur. So I've got, a, I've got a quote here. This is probably my favorite quote of all time. So I hope, you, I hope you're excited about it. It's probably my number one quote. It's quite long. It's by a guy called John Piper. Um, and um, it's from a book called Don't Waste Your Life, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a good book. And he says this, he says, you don't have to know a lot of things for your life to make a lasting difference in the world. But you have to know a few great things that matter and be willing to live or die for them. The people that make a durable difference in the world are not the people who've mastered many things, but those who have been mastered by a few great things. And if you want your life to count, and if you want the ripple effects of the pebbles that you drop to become waves that reach the ends of the earth and roll on for centuries into eternity, you don't have to have a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or riches. You don't have to come from a fine family or a fine school. You just have to know a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things and be set on fire by them. Amen. And this is what happens in Thomas's life. He hears this message and it grips him, this realization that Jesus is alive, this encounter with the risen Jesus absolutely changes everything in his life. And in that sense, the same is true of us. Everything that we do in the Christian life is, is in response to hearing this apostolic message. Paul in Romans 12, he sums up his first 11 chapters. If you've ever read the book of El of Romans, the first 11 chapters are so dense, and in Romans 12 he sums it up by saying, in view of God's mercy, let us offer our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. And he sums up all of that message from Romans 1 to 11 as us responding to God's mercy. And I just wonder, when, when you heard this apostolic message for the first time, did it encounter you and lead to this same kind of experience that we see Thomas has here? The apostolic message of Jesus risen from the dead. A guy called Jim Packer describes the apostolic message as being adoption through propitiation. Adoption through propitiation. And probably, if I've used some, some big words, you might, you might discount that straight away. You might say, I'm not really into Christianity in big words. But I was thinking about this the other day, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But even to order a coffee today, you need to know the language, and you need to know the words. If you work, walk into Costa, you can't just say, can I have a coffee? They say, well, do you want a cappuccino, a latte, a flat white, whatever. You've got to know the language. Even to order a cup of tea, you can't just only use the English breakfast or Darjeeling or, or green. You've got to know the language of the world to be able to even order a, a hot drink in some places. And it helps if we can use the language of the Bible when we talk about this apostolic message. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 1 to 11. He talks about adoption through propitiation. And adoption, we probably get that. That's where a father in heaven causes his children calls us home, calls us his sons and his daughters, but that adoption takes place through propitiation. And what that is, is a sacrifice that's made to turn away God's wrath and anger. And on the cross, that's what Jesus did, is he paid the price. He was a sacrifice that took place in our place, so the penalty and the punishment that we deserved was handed out to Jesus. He took the consequences of our sin and our mistakes, and because of that sacrifice, and through that sacrifice, we are adopted as sons and daughters by the Father. And unless we come to Jesus on that basis, unless we come to the Father on the basis of Jesus' work on the cross, we have no access to the Father at all. That adoption takes place through the shed blood of Jesus. And it's that apostolic message that's gone out to all the world and we're called to respond to. 
And this is the first aspect of Thomas's heart change, is he hears the apostolic message. The second thing he does is he encounters the patience and mercy of Jesus. So it says here, very famous words he says, but he said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. And then what happens eight days later, the disciples were inside again and Thomas was locked with them, although the throat was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. I don't know if you've ever had one of those experiences where you've said something and then know, someone knows exactly what you've said. As a parent, you can often overhear kids, can't you? Say something and then come around the corner and you say, look, I know exactly what you said. And Thomas is undone in this moment, isn't he? Because Jesus knows exactly what he's been saying. And I think what hits him in this moment is, is how does Jesus know what he's been saying? Because Jesus hasn't been meeting up with the disciples in, in, in private and saying, oh, come on, tell me what's Thomas been saying? And Peter said, you don't know, believe what he said this week, and he said this and this and this. No, Jesus knows what Thomas has been saying because he's the God of the universe and because he knows men's hearts. And what undoes Thomas in this moment, moment is that Jesus turns up and he knows exactly what Thomas has been saying. He knows exactly the attitude of his heart. And in that moment, at his most broken, at his moment of biggest weakness, Jesus still comes to him. And I want to say the same thing to you as well. Jesus knows the inclinations of your heart. He knows your sin. He knows the mistakes you've made. And even those things, when, the, when you're locked away in the dark and no one else in the world can see, all of heaven watches on. And Jesus knows each and every sin and mistake that you've made. And yet he still comes. He still chooses to come. And it's that patience and mercy of Jesus that we see in this passage. We see that even though Thomas had been saying these things, yet he still comes. And I just want to say, I think it's this moment that begins to break Thomas's heart. He's heard the message, and now he sees and experiences the mercy and, Jesus, or mercy and patience of Jesus for himself. And one thing I want to say, maybe a side point, is in the world, this story is often known as the story of doubting Thomas, isn't it? I just want to say, I don't think we should call this story the story of doubting Thomas. I think that's such a worldly way to view what happens in this story. Because some parts of the world, the Eastern Church for example, call this guy Thomas the Confessor. Because what he does really well is he confesses that Jesus is Lord and God. And what I want to say is, the sins that defined us before we were a Christian don't define us anymore. Thomas was a, a doubter. That's what he was. But the sins that defined him before he was a Christian don't define him anymore. When I was growing up, I was particularly impatient. I remember just having real issues being able to wait for anything. But no one calls me impatient Tom. Yeah? Maybe you were particularly uh, stubborn or hard work or catty. No one calls you that anymore. That's not how you are known in heaven. You're known as a son and a daughter of the king. Amen. And those sins that defined you before you became a Christian don't, don't define you anymore. The issue is in our world that, that labels really stick. Labels stick. Now this, this isn't a political statement, but I noticed when Donald Trump was running for president, it's not a political statement, he was particularly good at, at, at picking out nicknames for his opponents. You know, uh, Lying Ted or Sleepy Joe. And the issue is, those labels stuck. And maybe there have been things that have said over you in your life, you know, uh, not very good looking, not very clever, lazy, arrogant, or whatever. Those things can feel like they stick. But with Thomas, we often call him Doubting Thomas, but after this moment, that doubting season is over. The things that defined him before this moment are gone. And the encounter with Jesus' patience and mercy brings about a transformation in his life. And the same is true of you. If you've encountered Jesus' patience and mercy towards you, it, it melts your heart and changes your heart. 
I was trying to say that the things that defined you once don't have to define you anymore. This freedom and this grace in Jesus' name. The amen. third, oh man, yeah, well done. The third thing we see is that that Thomas sees the wounds of Jesus. He sees the wounds of Jesus. I'll read the same bit again. Jesus turns up and says, "Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put your put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe." And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. The bit I want to particularly focus on there is that Jesus says, see my hands. He invites Thomas to come and, come and see the wounds. And I just want to encourage you in the same way. I mean, have you, have you seen the work of Jesus that he's done for you on the cross? Have you seen Jesus? Have you beheld Jesus? Have you seen his wounds? Because in this instance, Jesus doesn't turn up to Thomas and say, Thomas, believe me and obey. He doesn't turn up and say that. He says, Thomas, have you seen my wounds? Look at my wounds. Come and touch them. He doesn't say, believe me and obey. He says, have you seen my wounds? And of course, belief and obedience are key in the Christian life, aren't they? You have to believe and you have to obey. But that's not where it starts. It starts with seeing the wounds of Jesus. It starts with seeing his hands and his side. And if we come to Jesus on the basis of thinking that he's a person who's going to sort our life out and be a good moral coach to us, if we come to Jesus seeing him as a life coach who's come to change me from being a morally bad person into a morally good person, we've completely missed what Jesus is about. Because Jesus came not to change me from being morally bad to being morally good. He changed me from being dead to being alive. And that's how it works. I was thinking about this. I've got a really vivid memory from when I was a child. Um, and this is, this is a terrible illustration, really. But I remember I was probably a teenager sitting downstairs. And I remember thinking, my room is a real mess. I need to go and tidy it. It's, 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 it's a bit gross. A bit, I need to go and tidy my room. And I have a memory of going upstairs with the purpose of tidying my room. And at the same time, I went past my mum and she said, Thomas, which is what she calls me, your room's a mess. You need to go and tidy it. And even though I was going with the intention of tidying that room, I said to her, no, it's not. I don't, it doesn't need tidying. It's absolutely fine. I'm not doing it. And even though I decided in my heart that's what needed to happen, when my mum came, bless her, um, you know, and said, you need to tidy your room, she, she said, you need, to, you need to obey me and do that room. I decided in my heart, no, that's, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something else. A very disobedient son, uh, not very honouring to father and mother. But that's our reality, isn't it? When someone comes to us and says, these are the rules that you need to follow, the natural inclination of our broken heart is to say, no, that was the issue with the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. There were hard hearts and rules, external rules being applied to hard hearts in the hope of conforming them. Uh, and, and God himself says there was an issue in, in Hebrews, 11, Hebrews 8. It says the hearts of the people were hard. And so they couldn't change. And when we come trying to impose external rules on our life, We've missed that the first step has to be this realisation of what Jesus has done for us. We've got to see his wounds. And as you read through the Bible, especially the, the letters in the New Testament, one of the things that the writers say over and over again is, have you considered Jesus? Have you beheld Jesus? Have you looked to Jesus? Yes, as in the moment that you were saved, yes. But also on a daily basis, have you looked to his wounds? Have you seen what he's done? Hebrews 2 says... We must pay much closer attention unless we drift away. Have you, have you seen the wounds of Jesus? A guy called Sam Storm, Storm says, if you haven't seen them, you won't truly live. If you haven't seen the hands and feet of Jesus, what he's done on the cross, then you won't, you won't truly live. Then we're going to sing a song later, one of my favourite hymns of all time. It's uh, Crowning with Many Crowns. And it says... In one of the verses says, Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and sighs. Rich wounds, yet visible above in beauty glorified. The third thing we see 
in this heart transformation is we see that Thomas, he sees the wounds of Jesus. And the fourth thing he does is he drops his conditions. He drops his conditions. Let me have a look at this again. It says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. In this moment, what happens is uh, Jesus appears to Thomas and says, have you seen my wounds? Come and touch them. And you might have noticed this, but Thomas actually doesn't come and touch the wounds. He just drops down and says, my Lord and my God. Because in that instance, Thomas realizes that he's a believer who's brought in conditions in his relationship with Jesus. He's, he said, Jesus, if you do this, then I'll do this. And we've probably all been there, haven't we? We've said, Jesus, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you sort my finances out, then, then I'll be a, a Christian. You know, if you find me a husband or a wife, then I'll be a Christian. You know, if you sort my car out, then I'll pray every day. Yeah, if, if you make work go smoother, then I'll read my Bible every day. And we put conditions in, don't we? We say, if you do this, then I'll do this. And what I want to say is, if you approach God in that metric, you show what it is that you're really worshipping. Because whatever that if thing is, is the thing that you worship. If you say, God, if you sort out my finances, I'll follow you. The thing that you're actually saying is, finances are the thing that I worship. And Jesus is the means to get me there. If you say, Jesus, find me a wife, and then I'll worship you. Actually, what you're showing is relationship is the thing that you worship, not Jesus. He's just a means to get you there. If you say, I need this new car, and Jesus said, if you get me this car, then I'll read my Bible every day. What that shows is it's the car that you worship, and Jesus is the means to get you there. And Thomas has done the exact same thing. He says, if you do this, then I'll do that. If you come, then I'll do this. And what happens at this moment is that Thomas realizes is that he's a disciple who's put conditions in his relationship. And I want to say to you that that conditional discipleship is not discipleship. Conditional following of Jesus, it is not following of Jesus. He won't have it where you give 80% of yourself or 90% of yourself. And the most dangerous word that you can put into your prayer life is that word if. If you start saying to Jesus, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you take care of that, then I'll do this. That's, that's, that's not how it works. And that's what Thomas realized in this moment, is that in order to be a, a Christian, in order to be a disciple, he had to drop all of his conditions. Mm. He had to drop all of his rationale and come to Jesus on his terms. Mm. And this morning, if you're a Christian, one of the things that had to happen in your life is that you realize you, you have to come to Jesus on Jesus' terms and not on your own terms. There's no, there's no treaty to be made. There's no contract to be signed. You come to Jesus on his terms. And those are the four things that we see in this passage. We see, first, Thomas heard the apostolic witness. Have you heard the apostolic witness this morning? That Jesus is alive. Second thing, we see he's melted by the patience and the mercy of Jesus. Have you, have you experienced that patience and mercy for yourself this morning? That your sins are the reason they died, for he came anyway. Third, have you, have you seen the wounds of Jesus this morning? Have you seen his work on the cross this morning for you? And fourth, have you dropped all of your conditions and come? I want to just say, but by way of closing, that that is the way to experience true and lasting joy in the Christian life. When this heart transformation comes, when you respond to the work of Jesus, when you drop your conditions and follow him, that's the source of real and lasting joy. I found these two quotes this week when I was reading, and I wanted to share them with you uh, just by way of maybe closing and encouraging you to think on your own Christian life and your own Christian journey. And they're both linked to joy and discipleship. Uh, the first is by a guy called Jonathan Edwards, and it says this, God is glorified not only 
by his glory being shown and seen, but by his glory being rejoiced in. When those who see God's glory delight in it, it is more glorifying to him than when people only see it. What he's saying there is, God is glorified in your life when people look at you and see this heart transformation that's taken place and see the joy that's coming out from that place. Have you had a heart transformation that's led to real joy being seen by people? Second quote is by a guy called John Flavel and it says, ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul and are the way that promotes sanctification. Ecstasy and joy is essential to your soul. What I'm going to say is this heart transformation, this dropping of conditions, this seeing Jesus for who he is, this hearing the apostolic message, this beholding him on the cross, that is the way to real and lasting joy. And that ecstasy and joy is central to the Christian life. And I just want to encourage you, we're going to worship and maybe in this next season, there's something there that's particularly stirred in your heart. Maybe there's a particular area where you feel like, actually, um, I'm really struggling with joy in my life. Or I'm really struggling with patience. Or I'm really struggling with, with this coming to Jesus on his, his terms and dropping conditions. Um, we were singing before, weren't we? My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I come to the Father again and again and again and again. And it's just an opportunity for us this morning to come to the Father and ask for each of us just to have that, that heart check, that heart surgery to take place. And maybe even here to, to have an increase in joy and peace. Uh, the, the verse that comes to mind is that the kingdom of God is not about meat and drink, but about righteousness, joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's